Good meeting. I'm, I'm a geophysicist and a food scientist um, and some other things as well. And I, I started a project called Future Food and I want to tell you some new innovations which has happened in the recent years or recent month or recent days um, when it comes to replacement of, of animal products. So, of course, anyone could argue that we don't need any replacements. We have enough alternatives for animal products at hand. But anyway, it is um, useful and very helpful if we can produce meat-like stuff or maybe even meat without animals or we can produce eggs or milk alternatives which uh, help us to, to reach the consumers. Good. Um, yeah, there are many reasons for that, of course, you know that. I, I, I want to just rush through. There are environmental reasons for us to replace animal products, health reasons, animal welfare reasons, of course, or animal rights reasons, and well, nutrition reasons. Well, this is one of the, one of the basics which uh, explains the environmental issues, most of them, um, why meat production is such a, uh, requires so much land, so much water, it's such a huge water polluter, it's uh, the biggest rainforest structure and all these things. And also very bad for world nutrition because it just lengthens the food chain. We put in the food we could eat ourselves into some into the animal which um, who makes let's say needs 95 percent or 90 percent or something 85 depending on the species of these calories for their own metabolism and then we produce something which people eat which is very inefficient compared to eating. The calories directly, of course. What we mainly produce in factory farms globally is uh, garbage or, or shit. Shit. And you, <laughs> shit, that's what we produce. We have uh, 65 billion animals which primarily, primarily produce shit out of calories. And we, we destroy rainforests to produce shit on these areas. On one, third of, on one third of the areas of the arable land, we produce more or less manure. That's what we do. And we are just one seventh of the calories globally go to um, what people really want out of this system, which is very inefficient, of course. This is an overview. Before I come to the innovations, I just give you an overview why it's so important. I, I, first, I, I mentioned four points. This is a little bit more detailed one. Uh, the consumption of animal products is the biggest land consumer, water consumer, water polluter. The biggest contributor to rainforest destruction in history, um, when you think of the Amazon, about 90% of the destructed areas were destroyed because of um, either feed um, production or grazing land for the animals. Then, of course, it's um, the biggest food waster on this planet. There's nothing else where we destroy so many resources for human food consumption than here. Of course, it's the biggest um, biggest cause of animal suffering. It's 65 billion animals we produce each year. There's nothing more what we humans do, at least, uh, which causes more suffering. No, no animal testing, nothing like that. It's comparable to the food consumption. And then we have some um, health issues. And these are not just health issues concerning our personal health but also concerning global health, let's say antibiotic resistance, for example. We, um, <coughs> when we take Europe, we approximately use 70% of antibiotics in uh, animal factory farming. And it doesn't work without that. So it's quite, if people say this is a very stable system, we will not overcome it easily. Well, that's not so sure, because uh, without antibiotics, you could not raise so many animals in such a, such bad conditions and um, using all these antibiotics leads to antibiotic resistances which uh, first of all will endanger the factory farming system but also human medicine of course and it's a risk for pandemics and many other things a risk for our personal health of course loss of biodiversity cause of soil erosion uh, of course of course climate change all these issues again okay? so there's a really a lot of issues and if you take out just one of them let's say of course in our of our case the billion fold suffering of animals but you could take any of them this alone would be a reason to find alternatives but we have all these 
in the collection. This is not maybe not the most beautiful slide you've ever seen, but it's maybe a very condensed. It is, has has lots of lots of content in it. So I think it's a quite remarkable thing. So there are many reasons, and each of these reasons alone would be enough to to think about alternatives and all of them together. Of course. Yeah, that's why we talk about alternatives and solutions for these problems. What could lead to a collapse of factory farming globally? Many, many of us try to do it with ethics, with um, try to convince people that it's not good to eat animals. This is very, very important. This is my personal favorite, of course. But I've, I've put many question signs here saying that this might not lead us to um, a revolution where when we say we want to free the animals out of factory farming practices um, then but it's a nice thing so that's green green means nice red means not so nice <laughs> so another option would be that we find alternatives so we find something which is cheaper better tastier whatever than meat but it's not meat it's not at least not meat from animals then this could be an alternative okay this could help us to get people away from it factory farming or from cons consumption of dead animals. And then if we don't do that, there might be some catastrophes leading to a, a breakdown of the factory farming system. This could be um, theoretically food shortages um, due to climate change, maybe to a growing population, um, other things. We need the croplands for other issues like production of fuels and things like that. This could be what, what I mentioned before, antibiotic resistances, which um, means that antibiotics do not function anymore, which means I cannot keep animals healthy in, in such bad conditions how we, we, we raise them nowadays. So we are depending on those uh, antibiotics. It could be as, as well as a severe, a serious pandemic coming out of the factory farming system, which um, we which spreads among humans and which um, might also lead to a breakdown of this system. So we cannot really predict what, what's coming up. So, but anyway, there are positive approaches, negative approaches. Maybe nothing will change for a few more years, decades, we don't know, but it's not so likely as many people maybe pessimistically think. But anyway, if we talk about, I want to talk about a positive issue and positive and this one here. So not about this one, but most of the talks here on this um, today or next day or yesterday, yesterday were human ethics, but more about um, alter finding alternatives to animal products. Yeah, in general, they, we have these uh, categories. We have vegetarian meat alternatives. You all know them. When we have, of course, the same alternatives for milk, let's say soy milk, almond milk, whatever. Okay. We have uh, replaces of egg products or eggs already. And a, a few years ago, we just had egg products replacements for the industry, but nowadays we also have real fried eggs. Uh, maybe you know, there's some some companies producing this, uh, but without without the real egg, it's just a it's just a copy, it's just a simulation. And then we have new approaches for these already mentioned plant-based alternatives, like. You know, this bleeding plant burger I will come to it, or using artificial intelligence maybe as, as a food designer, things like that. I will talk about the, all these issues today. And then, of course, those more futuristic um, things that we really grow meat. It's not a copy, it's real meat, but without an animal, outside of an animal, you know, what people call lab grown meat. And uh, we will see a video if we have enough time and if it works. I was just playing with that. I mean, just before that, I hope it works is via the internet. And, and things like biofermentation. I will go to these issues in detail. Yeah. Well, I rush through these things which are quite um, well known, like um, vegetarian meat. Of course, you, know, you all know the soy based alternatives. Out of soy, you can make different um, applications like. Soya meat, te textured vegetable protein, but also more, um, more traditional ones like tofu or tempeh. There's also one, one, two companies globally using sprouted soybeans as a basic for 
great alternatives. And then you do the same, you can do the same with sweet loop beans. All of these things which you do with soy, you can also do with sweet loop beans. And then wheat is also quite well known. But there's also other applications like um, fermented fungi. You, many of you might know corn. corn. But it's not available in Austria. I don't think it's available in Germany. Still. It is. It is already? Okay. Then we are just the only one in the German speaking countries where you cannot get it. So this is one this is one 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 more or less alternative approach. Then you of course you could use an algae. You could use rice or peas or different other vegetable fibers. There's companies for all of these applications, also for fresh mushrooms, which might be a more uh, costly <coughs> application. Yeah, and then you have some top brands, you know, the tofu to turkey with the tofu turkey. In the earlier times where we, there, a company which um, used to, in the initially used to focus on festivals. And then Guardian, who set the standard a little bit higher later on, and then you have these new things you might heard about, possible, impossible foods which is possible, obviously. <laughs> impossible Foods is, um, <clears throat> is, a, is a university project, kind of, but it uh, is now uh, something which is available. And, uh, and the special thing about Impossible Food is the bloody burger. It's a plant-based burger where you, when you bite on it, the blood comes out. It's a bloody <laughs> juice. It's um, made with plant-based heme, which is the... Uh, uh, ingredient, a main ingredient of our blood in our bodies and there's also plant-based versions from that and that's what they do. So maybe you find it funny or spectacular, but it's all, I think it's all, these are all small puzzle parts which make up the innovation of the future. So they are quite, of course they are, they are quite present in the media with these innovations because this is um, something spectacular. Very spectacular is the um, promotion of Beyond Meat. Beyond Meat uh, doesn't produce anything which is uh, totally different from other companies. <coughs> so they are using soy-based applications and they try to make perfect texture with their plant-based meats and all these things, but the other ones do that as well. But they are very much um, in the focus because they have very prominent supporters. So very recently, Leonardo DiCaprio uh, joined um, the funding of Beyond Meat, and in earlier times, also persons like Bill Gates and also Tyson Foods, which is quite uh, astonishing. Tyson Foods is um, the biggest chicken marketer of the world. It's an it's an U.S. company, and um, Tyson Foods. Many people would say it's the biggest chicken abuser on this planet. So that's what they are usually known for. Many of these videos from PETA and other organizations in the US where you really see abuse of chicken comes from Tyson companies. And Tyson invested into Beyond Meat. So tomorrow we will do a talk about if it's good or not, if we, uh, if um, meat organizations um, start to invest in vegan companies, if we do, if we like that or we reject that. And there's many reasons for both views and many other companies of course okay so that is a short overview of what we what you know about uh, plant-based alternatives then we have the plant-based alternatives to the plant-based alternatives to meat and now we switch over to plant-based alternatives to milk I just rush through that because it's not so interesting maybe for you about what are the exact ingredients of the different um, applications different <coughs> companies Anyway, if you want to have this um, presentation, at the very end I have a link, so it's you can download it online. If you, wish. you just maybe just take a photo if you want from the link and then you can look it up. And then some companies doing these applications. They are maybe interesting. They they do um, cheese alternatives, which are very different from, from the usual ones. So most cheese alternatives are pretty much made of starch and fats, whereas they try to put some protein into it, which makes them unique in this market. 
And then alternatives to egg products. Um, as I mentioned, uh, up to a few years ago, this was just the only focus was just to replace eggs in ready foods, you know, from bakeries or whatever, where uh, they used lots of um, egg, al egg alternatives, just as a binder or whatever the the egg is for. But um, nowadays we have um, some funny applications where you can really boil your egg, um, plant-based. Um, there was the first one I, I came across was the Wedge, a company from the US, but now we have an Austrian version as well, um, from Tyrol, my eye, which, um, that is also a company which, where you can produce eggs like this, and um, Christian, an Austrian, a friend of ours, I think he's not here at this conference. But he's, yeah, but we have that as well. So not just the application for the ready-made products, but also for the plant-based eggs for at home. Maybe people still find that a little bit funny that we really produce something which looks like an egg, it's a boiled egg, but anyway. It's good to have this all at hand. So the more alternatives we have, the better I think it is. So that's what I, what I always think. And we should not only focus on on a few and say this alternative is the one we should go for and we should skip the other ones. I think the more we have from artificial, so-called artificial applications to very natural applications, the wider the range is, the higher the chances that we really replace the animal products and that's what we do, want to do. So now something, that I, I rush through these things I rush through these things because I, I, I think most of this is uh, well known. This is something you probably have not heard about yet, and this is something um, which is also interesting. Also interesting because it comes from South America, where you usually have not that much of uh, innovation. Using artificial intelligence as a food designer. Um, that means, I just read it from here, it understands. First of all, to understand the molecular connections between food and the human, human perception of taste and texture. So that you say that you feed an artificial intelligent program, which just gathers data at first, and you feed them the connection between um, the molecular structure and what we perceive in our brain. So it should learn from that and it should replicate it. It should say, okay, when I eat an animal product, it's like this and that, uh, this, this is the molecular structure, and this is what people perceive. And I, I try to find something plant-based which is, has a similar structure, and I check out if it does the same in the brain of the humans, and if, we are, if I fail, the computer will learn it fails, and if I succeed, the computer will see, okay, this works. Okay. So it gets a connection. And then, of course, this is a, something which learns, 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 and never forgets anything. That's the advantage of using artificial intelligence in, in comparison with our intelligence. We uh, sometimes forget something, we uh, retire, we die. These computer programs never do that. So when they start to grow in intelligence, they always learn, 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 and never forget. And um, they also learn from, from trials which do not work. And therefore, this um, is what they call the most intelligent food designer, at least sooner or later, it will be something which is, of course, much more, has much more capacity than humans will ever be able to do. And of course, you can also feed in, if you, if you put some, um, you have um, the ingredients and you have some recipe, you can also say, okay, and this should not um, exceed this and that water footprint or carbon footprint, or uh, it should not have contain any of these allergenes or whatever, so you specify a recipe, the, the boundaries of the recipe, and then the computer can calculate with all the ingredients which are available, can, in, can calculate, and you say what the application should be, creamy, should be nice, okay, nice and creamy, and then you leave the computer with coming up with recipe which fulfill that. Also economically, you can say it should not be, it should not cost more than, let's say, two euros for a kilogram more. And then the computer can calculate and can try to find a new recipe. And it comes up with recipes humans would not easily come up with because it's not, not, um, not something which is 
no, it not taste. It should be tasty, but it's nothing which we we would believe it's tasty. <laughs> and then we try it out, and then we find out if it works, and if it doesn't work, we, the computer will have to find out from the data why it didn't work. And um, at least this is a very promising um, thing for the future. And um, yeah, we'll we'll see later see about IndieBio, which is a um, a lab in San Francisco, which where all these small start, many of the small startups, which do really innovative work, where they are based, and uh, not company also has a is is part of this. So we you will see them again later on. But this is a interesting approach. <coughs> and then we could do other things when we want to optimize the vegan future nutrition. You can um, in you can increase, or you can make the breeding enhancements for crops so that we have more, maybe more protein. You can do that without genetic modification as well, of course. Then fertilization of the crops, fortification of foods, which is important for us, vitamin B12, for example. And then you, you, you can invent more fermentation processes, which makes the food more nutritive or more nutritional, valuable for us. Yeah, then we have uh, fut futuristic approaches, next one. And it's still not lab meat, which I will come across later, or very soon. This is a bio-fermentation, which is uh, just, it's more or less just an idea. The idea is quite simple. When you take um, cereals, and you take a cow, and you take the consumers, many people will think that this is a three-element um, food chain. But actually, it's four elements, because the second element is hidden within the cow. The cow cannot eat the grass. So the thing is how to make food out of something you cannot eat. And many people say, OK, grazing will, will always be, uh, there's no alternatives for grazing animals. Many people say for world nutrition, because we could not use um, grazing land where you cannot grow crops for human nutrition. If we do not uh, use the cows or the sheep, we can eat the grass. Okay? And this is an alternative, and this is, could be a very efficient alternative, but we do not know about that so much. So the thing is, when the cow eats the grass, it doesn't eat the grass directly. It cannot, it cannot eat um, cellulosis. It's just mm -hmm. not possible. Within the cow, you have microorganisms. And these microorganisms convert the celluloses into proteins, and the cow then eats the proteins. And we eat the cow, not we. Yeah. Okay. So this is four, four steps. And um, the third step is very inefficient, because from these proteins, where the, the microorganisms produce within the cow, the cow needs 95% of these calories for its own metabolism. So out of 20 calories, we, we you lose 19 calories when you use a cow. But if we could skip the cow from this food chain, we just take the celluloses we cannot eat, okay? Then we take microorganisms, they produce something we can eat, because the cow can eat it, so we can eat it as well. Leave out the cow, and the next are we. So that would be like 20 times more efficient than using grazing cattle or sheep to produce um, proteins. Well, there is not much about this theory in practice. There's one, actually one company is kind of the same. Alga, Alga Via, Terra Via. They, um, they did something like that with algae or they tried to use microorganisms to produce out of municipal green waste. So really cellulosis we cannot use. It's really waste. And they tried to produce some sugars or proteins or algal oils. So that's what we really would be able to eat. So these are, this might be something for the future. This is not really, it doesn't really fit in with the other topics here because the other topics focus on really replacing meat and uh, eggs and dairy and doing something which is very similar or the same. Whereas this could be anything. It, we don't really know what it tastes like. It happens within the cow and we, and the cow doesn't cannot taste it because it's already after what the cow tastes. It's it's really within the cow, and we don't know what we could produce out of these 
technology. If it tastes well, or if it would just be more efficient uh, feed for factory farmed animals. So there's also something I just I just want to wanted to present to you that this could be a revolution for world nutrition for the future as well. Okay. And then of course cultured meat. Cultured meat, nowadays also called clean meat, so we are already in the stage where we, where we think about um, the way how to communicate this in the best form, or in vitro meat, which maybe sounds the less attractive of these three terms. Well, this is um, what people call usually lab meat, lab meat, and laboratory meat. But I have to admit that this is not, not a fair thing to talk about laboratory meat because um, everything is first prototyped in a laboratory. Like, yeah, we will see that later in the video. I think this is very pers pers convincing. Um, when we, when you, when you start to produce a new sort of beer. It starts in the laboratory, later on it goes to the brewery. And that's the same with um, when you use cells to out of the animal to produce meat, then it starts um, in, a, in a laboratory and then it goes to the brewery. So we could talk about brewed meat, which means that we take cells, we take uh, media to grow, for the cells to grow in, and it, we need some uh, growth factors to tell these cells that they should become muscle cells instead of anything else. We don't want to grow bones or anything like that. Um, and then we need something which makes it a three-dimensional uh, structure. And um, usually the, talking about edible scaffolds, or you can bioprint them, maybe you can print out your steak, maybe layer per layer. There's also an alternative because what what is not necessary what is not possible is um, that we really produce something which is like human or animal meat um, exactly because when you take let's say one square one cube centimeter of my my meat which it has about one kilometer kilometer of capillaries so this is something which is not you know, it's, it would be it would be so techno techni technical uh, challenging to produce something with so many kilometers of, of um, capillaries just for let's say a few cents or something. It's, it's just worth nothing. It's when you take meat from factory farming farmed animals, it's so cheap. So uh, this will not be possible. So we we have to get the nutrients to the cells, and how do we do that? Um, you sh in the body, you use these small um, blood vessels, whereas um, in in this kind of application, you have to find some other ways. And it could be scaffold scaffolds, which are um, has huge surfaces and the, the cells attached there. Or you could as well um, use, as I told you, the bioprinter. If you just print the steak layer by layer, this could also be an application. But what is maybe more interesting than the technology, you can read about the technology. Um, I gave you this one, for example. This is a very, this is a very recent um, overview of how the technology exactly works. Okay? Anyway, you get the link with all the links like, at the very end. Okay. <laughs> so, what, what is interesting is maybe, first of all, enough time. How did this um, idea come up? Who were the first uh, you, who thought about it? In the time before the internet, I thought I was the kind of, I had the feeling I was kind of the first one. In the early 90s, I thought, why not um, grow, grow meat out of an animal? It's just like when you want to get rid of slavery, it's not so easy. But when you have, for example, when you have machinery as an alternative, which are more efficient, then it could be possible, or it was possible in history. So we had an alternative to slavery for, for agriculture. And uh, the idea is quite, I think the idea is quite similar that we say, if we have something which is meat, but it doesn't come out of an animal, this would help us to get away from factory farming, and from any kind of animal killing for meat. 
Well, I did not know by that time in the early 90s that I was not the only one thinking about this. And I did not know that even Winston Churchill thought about these issues about in the middle of the last century. He had the idea that if I just want to eat the chicken breast, why produce a whole chicken and not just the breast? <laughs> but there were many others. And when, I, when, when the internet came up in, in, uh, around the yeah, millennium, I found out that there were others on this planet uh, having the same idea, not just the idea, but they were further, they already had a patent, or they were artists. They did not really produce that. It was, it was still futuristic to them. Okay? But it, they had the idea, they, they did artistical um, stuff. Or well, they talked about it, they had the ideas how to really do that. So the technology I just mentioned is very short. Vladimir Milanov, I remember one of the first animal rights conferences here in Vienna, we invited him, I think it was 2004 maybe. There was no mark post with a ready lab burger already. It was just an idea, it was just a vision. It was very long, it was until 2013, it was just, there was no prototype for that. It was just an idea. Still, there was already a, the first in vitro meat symposium in, in Norway. I attended that in 2008. That was also five years before the first lab grown meat ever was presented. Yeah. But then let's go to the to the present or future. Um, yeah. Mark Post in 2013 was the first one. And his team, they were the first one to really produce meat, not just something similar like meat, it was real meat out of the lot and out of cells, out, outside of an animal. And um, yeah, this burger was quite costly, of course, and he was supported by Sergey Brin from Bugi. Um, and then later on, this was, of course, a milestone. It was not, not the way we will produce it in future. It is still, they used animal products for it. They used um, this calf serum for, for, for growing the cells, which has nothing to do with what we want to go there, we want to go. But it was the first time we, should, we had to show something. And that was very important. And that also helps, of course, to get funding. And the fundings went up. Here you see 250,000 euro cost, which sounds maybe like much. But nowadays we are in a different, um, different area. We already have 17. Not 17 US dollars. <laughs> <laughs> There's something missing here. <laughs> okay, 17 million US. It's still maybe not the biggest um, sums we, we ever think about it. But 17 million US dollars were just gave to Memphis Meat, which are now on the front. Uh, they are the leading company on this planet um, in this area. And they got it from Bill Gates, Richard Branson. And also from Cargill, which is interesting. Cargill is uh, one of the biggest ag ag agro uh, yeah, giants on this planet. It's a huge company in the US. So um, they now they produce meatballs and things like that, chicken, chicken nuggets and, and things like that. And they, they, they do it in a quite regular step basis. How much does it cost? No, it's about it's down now about ten in ten dollars from some of the but it's just a small chunk. Nobody would pay for that. Mm -hmm. And that's maybe also the the interesting thing because many people think why are so many as in global view, now it's getting better, but a few years ago, many people asked why are so many uh, researchers working on medical applications when they use tissue engineering, this is a kind of a tissue engineering technology. <coughs> And why are so, so few companies um, working in this field? And that's because um, when you do medical applications, you could, um, let's say, produce a new kidney for somebody who can afford it for, from his own stem cells. And you could say, let's say, any, any number, okay, 50,000 50, US dollar or euro or something like that, okay? And people would pay for that. So that is something which is realistic. So you can have much money from small, small parts of tissue which you produce. But on the other hand, uh, if you have a new organ, it must really work in your body. It's much easier to produce meat, which doesn't have to work, just has to be eaten, 
uh, so that's the easier thing. But on the other hand, it must be very, very much cheaper. And it's really, really much a huge difference. And that's maybe why many uh, still, there's still skepticism that if it's possible <coughs> to produce something with this quite complicated technology to produce masses of, of meat very cheaply. So that's, that's, the, that's the question if we can do this. And um, this is a crucial question for the future. Many people think if people will reject or consumers will not eat it, but I think this can be overcome because they, this can have many, many advantages. It could be the much more uh, healthy meat. You can reduce the cholesterol, you could get out the fatty acids you don't like, and you get in the omega-3s just by uh, manipulating the, the, the what, what you feed to the animals, you know? It's just, it's much easier to, to influence than compared with an animal when you have normal meat from, from, from dead animals. So this can be overcome in many ways. Thanks very much. Um, but on the other hand, um, I think the main crucial point is um, costs. Can we drive down the costs? But back to these here. Um, Modern Meadow is also interesting. They, are, they did this 3D printing, and now they focus more on leather production. And they also have some billionaire in the background. They all have these, and in this case, it's the Peter Thiel Foundation. Peter Thiel is a PayPal um, initiator. So here we have Google, here we have PayPal, here we have um, Bill Gates, Richard Branson, Cargill, and different ones. Hampton Creek is interesting, also supported by Bill Gates. We have mentioned them before, not really, but um, on the on the slides it was mentioned um, when it comes to egg replacements. But they also announced that they want to have they want to produce at marketing prices or at, at, at market prices. They want to produce um, cultured meat in by the end of 2018. So let's let's see how far they come. And then we have um, some Israeli um, startups in the recent time. Um, the one is called Super Meat. Maybe you heard about it. They did some crowdfunding fundraising. Um, but they they do really good uh, work, and I heard articles that ch the Chinese try to get this technology from the Israelis as well. And then there's this one here and many others. And then there's also some NGOs. Oops. But, uh, but that's not so interesting. There's some NGOs working on this, like Good Food Institute or New Harvest, for example. Or also future food, but this is just small. Um, yeah, and then you have other applications like uh, real meat, re uh, real milk, real eggs, and real fish. Like Finless Foods, Clara Foods, Perfect Day, Perfect Day working on milk replacements, Clara Foods, egg replacements, Finless Foods on fish replacements. Not replacements, but actually real fish, but without the animal. And um, yeah, this is, for example, how the milk how the milk um, from the laboratory or the, from the brewery will be produced. There's some genetical step in it, just some GMO <coughs> step, but the final product is should be GMO free. That's just that's different to the to the uh, in vitro or uh, the cultured meat, where um, usually you do not have to have any GMO <coughs> steps within. So this is important in Europe, where it's quite there's lots of skepticism to this. Uh, in this area, you know, well, I want to show you this video if it works. <coughs> so we take a small sample from a real fish, and from that, we have <coughs> an incredible amount of fish. Theoretically, each cell can become one ton of meat. When we started IndieBio, we really wanted to accelerate all of biotech, all of biology. Uh, one of the largest areas is really food. A few animal alternative companies are 
uh, Clara Foods, they grew egg whites of gelator, which makes gelatin, so we can finally have that vegan kosher halal gummy bear, New Way Foods, which is a plant-based shrimp company, and then Notco as well. So Notco uh, just provides oh, those the dairy and eggs. Artificial intelligence. Memphis Meats is the leader in cultured meat. They're calling it clean meat. They brew uh, meat, so it's not fake meat, it's real meat, brewed in a reactor, a bioreactor, uh, and that can be essentially scaled to meet almost any type of demand. It looks a lot like regular yogurt, and, and right now I'm just switching it around on my spoon, and it's, it has the thickness. Wow, that does taste like normal yogurt. I can, I'm trying to think about how this is different, and I'm not coming up with anything. Awesome, that's the idea. Ooh, that's pretty good. So you're, you're actually making a mimic of meat and dairy in the lab. That is exactly what we're making. We're pushing our technology to actually create formulations just using natural ingredients. So when you read the ingredient label, it's super, super clean. And this is in Spanish, but I kind of understand the ingredients list yeah. more than I understand most ingredients yeah. lists in English. At Finless Foods, what we're doing is we're creating real, non-vegan, non-vegetarian fish meat but we're doing it outside of a fish. Do people seem open to eating this? Because it is real fish, but it's not grown, it's grown in a lab, not plucked out of the ocean like you would expect. We take a little bit of issue with saying it's grown in a lab because, you know, people don't say beer is grown in a lab. Beer is prototyped in a lab and then produced in a brewery. Our fish is prototyped in a lab and then produced in a brewery as well. <coughs> Which fish is more natural? The fish that's filled with mercury and plastic and growth hormone or the fish that we create that has none of those things? One of the huge shifts we're going to see for humanity as a whole is an understanding that with biotechnology, biology as a technology, we can basically brew almost anything. Everything from spider silk uh, to meat to all sorts of other products.